Hi everyone. So I thought it would be kind of fun to do some videos, um, maybe just exploring some fun or interesting computations that can be done, you know, without a lot of heavy mathematical machinery or background. Um, so maybe, you know, for example, for this one, um, I might assume some background in uh, maybe a course in undergraduate calculus, linear algebra, ordinary differential equations, and that kind of thing. Uh, but maybe you, you don't necessarily need a, a graduate background in mathematics um, to see what's going on. So the one I wanted to talk about today uh, was a computation uh, that I really liked from my own undergraduate years. I was taking a discrete mathematics course and we had a section on recurrence relations. Um, and at that time I was reading this other book called uh, Generating Functionology by Herbert Wilf. Uh, and he has a great sort of computation in the first chapter there. Um, which shows how to derive the or derive a, a closed form expression for the Fibonacci sequence, uh, which I thought was really neat and sort of exhibits how useful and interesting and magical generating functions are. So these are one of my favorite topics. So I thought it'd be kind of fun to share it. So let me just kind of say what the goal is. If you haven't seen the Fibonacci sequence, don't worry, I'll, I'll tell you what it is uh, in just a moment. But the idea is, um, you know, given given a sequence, right, so just some ordered list of numbers, it makes sense to ask what is the say, the nth entry in this list? What is the nth element of this sequence? And uh, in general, um, you know, you can sort of define sequences by recurrence relations, where maybe computing the nth uh, term involves maybe computing some of the k less than or equal to n terms, so some of the stuff you've computed beforehand. Um, but with this, this method of, of generating functions, sometimes you can just solve for that explicitly. You, know, you just ask yourself, wouldn't it be nice if somebody just handed me an n, I could tell you what the nth element in this list is without necessarily going back and computing all of the elements prior to n. So let me just say um, what the Fibonacci sequence is. This is a reminder, um, or if you haven't seen it before, then it's maybe useful. This is the Fibonacci sequence. And there's just kind of a rule, a recipe uh, for doing it. So I, there's a little bit of, of silliness. I have to tell you what the first two um, are. I could just give them to you. But after that, after that second term, there's a recipe. And it goes like uh, the following way. You just take for the next term in your sequence, uh, the way you obtain it is you take the previous two terms and you add them up. So for example, here I add these two up to get two, I add these two to get three for my next term, I add these to get five, so on and so forth, five plus three, eight. five plus eight is 13, eight plus 13 is one, so on and so forth, and continue off to infinity. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll maybe label these this first element will be a naught. The second will be a one. This will be a two. A three. And then a four. Um, and so on and so forth. The nth term of the sequ sequence will be called a n. And it satisfies the following recurrence relation. Essentially, the recipe I just told you, provided that uh, you're in this sort of range beyond those first two that it took to get the sequence uh, started. Right, because you had to have two things to add up. Uh, goes the 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 recipe is is the following: that if you want the a n plus first or the n plus first element of this sequence, you obtain it by looking at the nth term and adding it to the n minus first term. So that's at least a formula for how to get it. And in general, a recurrence relation can be any function. So this a n plus one on the left hand side can be any function of k where k is less than or equal to n. So it could include many, many more terms. Um, it could also be like a much more complicated function. You could take something like that term and square it, or you could take a square root of the entire thing. You can sort of do lots of very complicated things with recurrence relations. Uh, but this will be sort of a, a linear recurrence relation. So if you've seen something in seen a little bit of, of ODEs, ordinary differential equations. Um, this is uh, very analogous to like a linear second order um, differential equation, ordinary differential equation. 
And so um, you might remember if you've seen that, that uh, differential equations, for example, um, sometimes you, you may not have a solution or you may have sort of a, a huge family of solutions. And in order to pin down one solution, you need to sort of uh, set some initial conditions or some boundary conditions. And that turns out to be the case here as well. So this determines quite a lot of sequences. Um, but I need to tell you what the at least two terms of this sequence are, the first two. And we decided above that we're going to start with one and one for these two here. And this is kind of the standard Fibonacci sequence. But in reality, um, I could just give you sort of, I could prescribe different values for this A0 and this A1. And you could still run the same recipe after those first two, and you would get some other type of Fibonacci sequence, which is related but not equal on the nose to this, this sequence up here. So this is enough to um, specify occurrence relation times the Fibonacci sequence. And there's like a general method to solve these, these kinds of things. Uh, well, really, there are many methods, just as there are many methods to solve a differential equation. Um, so the method that we're going to be using is generating functions, which you can think of is an analogy to like solving an ODE using um, a power series kind of solution and expanding. So we'll use generating functions. But I'll also point out that there's there's a beautiful connection here. Um, the same way in ODEs, you can sort of do things like a, you know, for, for a linear second order ODE, you could look at this, uh, oh shoot, what is it called? The, the characteristic polynomial or something, um, and sort of read off the solutions from the properties of that polynomial. And that kind of thing actually will work in this situation too. Uh, but we'll use this, this generating function approach just to see how, how it goes. The reference, uh, see, did I write it down above? Okay, so now I'll write it here. The reference to see for this is chapter one of Wilf's Generating Functionology. Generating Functionology. A great book, and I highly recommend it. Um, but I'll just go through the method that's discussed there for how to solve. Um, again, the, the problem is, is we want to find, say, what a n plus 1 is in just a closed form, as maybe just a function of n, as opposed to a function of the a sub n's. So, right, again, this saves me from having, having to compute all of these, these smaller ones in order to get the nth or n plus first one. So the method uh, roughly goes as follows. The first thing you do is you name your function. So I'll call it capital F of x. And it's going to be a generating function is really just a power series. I'm just going to write this power series. A n is the sum over n bigger than 0, bigger than or equal to 0, of a n times x to the n. The point here is that if you, if you expand this out, you're going to see your sequence living inside of this series. This will be a0 plus a1x plus a2 x squared, and so on. And so you can just see that the, the ends on the, the exponents are really just keeping track of where the elements of your sequence are. So Wilf calls this uh, a generating function is like a clothesline upon which you, you can hang your sequence. Um, so really it's, it's carrying the same information, um, or it's carrying at least as much information. As it turns out, it miraculously somehow carries more information, which is why it's useful. So once we've given a name to it, um, Here's sort of the, the, uh, the main work that goes into, um, well, what, what we want to do is really try to solve for this f of x as maybe some closed form kind of function that isn't a power series. You could imagine if these, um, if these ans were coming from a, like a geometric progression, so if this was a geometric sequence, then we could sum this and get 1 over 1 minus x, which is a rational function of x. And that's kind of a really nice situation to be in, so we're going to try a name for something like that. If I can get some kind of rational function of x uh, for f of x, then maybe we can do some things with that, maybe like expand it in a different way um, and get uh, some handle on what these, these coefficients might actually be as a function of, of n. 
So what you do is you start with your recurrence relation, a n plus one equal to, I just sum the previous two terms. And this, there's kind of a weird step here. What you do is you multiply both sides by x to the n. So let me just do that. And for, uh, for everything that's happening here, you can just think of the x to the n. This is really just some kind of like formal power series. The x to the n doesn't really have uh, meaning at this point, uh, but later on we might want it to. So we might actually go out into the complex plane and ask for this, this sequence to say converge uniformly on some small disk, in which case we can start doing like analysis with this sequence. But for now, we're kind of just doing algebra with it. So it's just some formal power series and x to the n is just keeping track of where we are in that power series. The next thing you do is you take this whole thing and you sum it over all of the ends for which the uh, for which the recurrence relation is valid. So that's that's kind of one tricky part here is that this recurrence relation I should have mentioned here is only valid for in well n plus one uh, what do I want to say here for for n bigger than or equal to two right because uh, if I was in this situation of just being the first two, um, right? If I wanted to compute this one, I had to go and sum up the two previous ones, but I don't even have two previous ones um, until I'm out here. This recurrence relation is only valid for some specific range, and we had these like manual initial conditions to specify the first couple. So what we'll do is sum over, I guess uh, maybe, this is valid for n bigger than 1, I think is actually what I want to say here. Right, because we started, we started counting at 0. So for n bigger than 1, then I should be OK. What I do in this step is sum over n bigger than 1. I have these these two terms in the sequences on on either side, um, so I've converted them into a power series. And now it's it's mostly just about playing games with these sequences um, to somehow cook up what I really want to see are like this, and I want to rename some sequences things that look like f of x. So what I'll do here is I'll note that um, so this n plus one on the coefficient doesn't match up with the the n that's appearing in the exponent, so I can just kind of force that to hold by pulling out a uh, power of x. So if I just write 1 over x, I can sum again over the same index set, a n plus 1. I can put an x to the n plus 1 here, right, because if I just multiply in this x, then I take a 1 off of that exponent. So I say I have the same thing on the left-hand side. For the right-hand side, I'm just going to go ahead and distribute the sum out into two sums. I get sum of n bigger than or equal to 1 of a n x to the n plus the sum of n n bigger than or equal to 1 of a n minus 1 x to the n. And so far, like, this one is looking pretty good. It looks close to f of x, except for um, maybe up to, up to some indexing uh, I might need to, to fiddle with. This one, I have kind of the same problem where the, the index doesn't match the exponent, but I can force that to hold by, let's see, what do I need to do here? I can take a 1 off of the index at the expense of putting an x out in front. So if I multiply that in, it adds 1 to the exponent, so I can undo it. And maybe now I just need to, um, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll just re rename some indices really quickly. Again, I just have this 1 over x on the left-hand side. Let me sum over l's. And I guess I want this to be a to the l, x to the l. So I guess what I'm doing here is letting l be n plus 1. I just have to figure out what the indexing set needs to be. l is kind of just a dummy variable that only lives inside of this, this series. Um, and this is bigger than or equal to 2 now, right? Because if 
n plus 1 is bigger than or equal to 2, n is bigger than or equal to 2. Uh, this one, I think I can just leave as is. Uh, a n x to the n. This one I'm going to do the same sort of trick where I just re-index, and I think I'll also call it, uh, maybe I'll call this one um, m n bigger than or equal to zero of a m x to the m. Where here I set m to be n minus one. So really just uh, just setting whatever the exponent was up there to be this this new variable, and then figuring out what how I need to change the indexing to match that match up with that. Okay, so now a little bit of trickiness. Um, what I realize is that what I have here is essentially f of x, except for the indexing is a little bit wrong. I've left off the first two terms. And just remember that f of x, this whole was just where I sum a n x to the n over all a n bigger than or equal to zero. Here, I'm summing over that for everything bigger than or equal to two. So I can rewrite this as f of x, but then I'm subtracting off the first term. And also, or I've, I've left out the, the first term and the second term. And that's just exactly what this, this series is. It's really just f of x. Leave, so that's the thing there. Leaving out the first two terms, which are those. Same deal here. This is really just f of x where I've left out the first term. This is f of x minus a naught. And I'm adding on to it, I guess this one is actually, yeah, this one is f of x on the nose, because I'm summing over everything uh, greater than or equal to zero. And what I really want to do here is solve for f of x. And I see that everything else, um, right, so it's going to be some kind of rational function because these a naughts, a ones that are showing up everywhere, these are just numbers. And it's going to be some powers of x, maybe some powers of 1 over x. So let's see. Um, maybe I'll just tell you what happens when you solve for f of x. Um, no, it's, it's not so bad. Let's, let's just do it. So we get something that's like, uh, let's move this f of x over here. So I get something like f, x, f of x. Or uh, let's see. Let me let me do this part first. We have f of x minus a naught minus a1x. And then I'm just going to multiply this x through. So I get x of x minus a naught x plus x squared f of x. And now maybe it's easier to solve for this f of x. So I get something that's like f of x is equal to, uh, we're going to have 1, let's see, so this is going to be some fraction. Uh, what is going to be upstairs? I think we'll have, we'll have this negative a naught, and then negative a1x. And maybe this, I'm, I guess I'm moving all of this stuff to the left-hand side. So I guess I get a plus a naught x. And then I think I get a 1, or a negative 1 plus x plus x squared, I think. Okay, so hopefully that's right. We'll see momentarily. So I know the values of a naught and a one. Uh, so what I get is negative one minus one times x plus one times x over negative one plus x plus x squared. And this whole thing is equal to, well, these two cancel out. Negative one up here, so I'll push it through to the denominator. I like get something that's like 1 minus x 
minus x squared. So I've solved for what um, this f of x is, and I got some rational function out of it. And this will turn out to be sort of useful. Um, right, so now I want to now run the game backwards, and I want to try to find some other way to expand this out. Um, and usually I'm going to try to see some kind of geometric series or something. That's that's a very easy thing to sum and find like a closed form for. So what I'll maybe do is um, try to apply partial fractions to this. So I'll get something that looks like 1 over 1 minus x minus x squared. Um, okay, so <laughs> this is this is a an order 2 polynomial, a quadratic. Um, I'll just tell you it does factor. Uh, if you just plug it into the quadratic formula, you'll get two uh, real roots. Um, maybe we'll write them in kind of a funny way. There'll be an r... Uh, plus floating around and an r minus floating around. These will be the two roots you get out of the quadratic formula. And I'm also kind of writing this in, well, okay, so these won't be the exact roots. You'll get some roots and then I'm calling r plus uh, something more like a reciprocal uh, root. Um, but once you rearrange, you can get something out of this form where r plus or minus will be equal to one half of one plus or minus root five. These these just happen to be the roots of this this polynomial. Now let me move this out of the way a little bit. We won't need what these the actual values of these roots are um, until a little bit later. If we're doing partial fractions. I just have two linear factors here, so this will end up being something of the form a over 1 minus r plus x. So just that first term, and then I can add v plus the other term, or over the other term, minus 1 over, sorry, v over 1 minus r minus of x. Uh, and right, let's see. So there is a clever way to sort of do this. Um, yeah, so let me let me see if I can explain. Um, what you do in order to find out what this value of a is, there's this um, sort of like a cover-up method. Uh, and if you Google it, I'm sure you'll find uh, a full description of how it works. But the idea is if you want to compute what this a is, you go back up to this expression here, um, and you cover up the co term corresponding to a. So this was this one minus r plus. So that just means you, you cover up this one minus r plus. So you're just thinking about just this fraction one over everything else. And in that everything else, you plug in the the thing that zeroes this out. That's a little bit tricky. Uh, but what I mean here is a is equal to essentially this thing. But what I do, so by covering up, what I really mean is I take this whole thing and I multiply it by 1 minus r plus of x. Again, that's just this term matched with this term, which was the denominator for the, the a. I'm just kind of removing that from the equation by multiplying it in. And I take this whole thing and I evaluate it at the thing that zeroes out this term. And the thing that zeroes that out is x equal to 1 over r plus. So if you do that, um, what you get is something that's like 1 over, all right, it's just this term that's left. Uh, you get 1 minus, so r minus times 1 over plus that kind of thing. If you multiply it out, you get r plus over 1 minus r minus. Or, sorry, uh, it would be r plus minus r minus. There we go. 
this thing is is our value of a and the way you do this for b is almost well it's, it, it's really the same method works discover a method for those that are interested this is really like some form of computing complex residues uh, so these are just like simple poles poles of order one for computing the residue there so if you want to find b you take this equation you look at the thing that was involved in b in our original partial fractions that was this r minus thing in the denominator so you multiply that out to achieve the effect of, effect of covering it up and so there's that term and we're multiplying it in to, to sort of cancel it out and then you evaluate at whatever thing would have zeroed this out so the thing that would have zeroed that would have been one over one one over r minus I plug that in at one minus one and i'll just tell you if you run through the same steps i uh, you essentially get well i mean we can just do it it's it's a uh, one over one minus x times r plus evaluated at one over r minus so you get an r plus over r minus now earlier it was a uh, r minus over r plus if you multiply this through you get an r minus over r minus minus r plus a negative r minus over r plus minus r minus that last step it's not clear that we need it yet but it's just to make it match up with the denominator that's happening here it was an r plus minus r minus this one was an r minus minus r plus so it's useful to Put in the negative sign there is our a there is our b so we can go back to our partial fractions and write this out now yep so let me grab this so our original function the whole thing we were trying to do was expand this one over one minus x minus x squared and we found what a was a was negative r r it was plus over r plus minus r minus and b was so the negative r minus let me just put the negative outside r minus over r plus minus r minus and so this is kind of why Having that same denominator is useful because we can pull it out. We get something like one over r plus minus r minus. And what we're left with is r plus over one minus r plus times x minus r minus over one minus r minus of x. Okay. Hopefully that works out. Uh, yes, okay, so everything looks good. So we've done partial fractions, and what's really nice about this is that um, this is a geometric series, or at least, I don't know, we're, we're assuming like everything's a formal power series. Um, so maybe we can expand this as a geometric series in some small disk in the complex plane. Uh, but you can also just expand it formally using that, write it really quick, one over one minus anything, uh, one over one minus y, for example is the sum over all indices bigger than or equal to zero. And what do you put there? You put, uh, well, it's gonna be a one and then a y to the n. But if you had some kind of like other t here, one minus ty, then this would be like a ty to the n. That's kind of what we're doing here, where the t is an r plus or an r minus. And then this thing up, up here, we can just pull it out as a factor in the sum. Let me just write this another way of saying what this is is we have this whole term floating around out in front one over r plus minus r minus and in here we have r plus times a sum this is n bigger than or equal to zero of let's see this should be r <laughs> Hmm. 
And I want to say this is r plus x to the n. Okay, this will work. Um, and we're subtracting off this r minus of the sum n bigger than or equal to zero of r minus x to the n. So what I'll do now is um, I'll multiply this term into the sum and multiply this term into the sum. Um, and just notice here that I would get like an r plus to the n, and this is going to change it to an r plus to the n plus 1 when I incorporate this extra term. Same deal here. There's like an r minus to the n happening there. I'm going to get an r minus to the n plus 1 when I pull in that new term. The 1 over r plus minus r minus out in front. And then we're multiplying this by the sum over the index set is still the same. We get an r plus to the n plus 1 times x to the n. And we're subtracting off a sum again over the same index set where it's r minus to the n plus 1 to the n. And these sums, these two sums have the same index set, so I can combine them by combining their terms. Uh, let me just rewrite just part of this. Take off all of this stuff. All that's happening here is I can just combine coefficients by grouping up all of the, the terms on a, on a like exponent. Like an r plus to the n plus 1 minus r minus to the n plus 1. All of that is showing up in the x to the n uh, term. Okay, and I guess maybe I'll go ahead and just pull in this last thing here. So what I get is sum of this form, n bigger than or equal to zero. Um, and maybe I'll just write c n x to the n, and that c n is going to be uh, so it's, it's this thing, r plus to the n plus one minus r minus to the n plus 1 over this thing that was out in front, 1 over r plus minus r minus. That's the coefficient of, of this, this power series. And I'll just tell you, um, you can sort of plug this into a symbolic calculator if you want to figure out. Just remember r plus minus, we had a number for that. Uh, it was equal to, see, so I want to say 1 plus or minus root 5 over 2, which I think is the golden ratio, but maybe don't quote me on that. I don't remember offhand uh, if that's exactly what it is, but it should be very closely related. Um, I'll tell you that, um, well, actually, it's, I guess it's pretty easy to see that if I take the positive one of these and I subtract off the negative, the only thing I'm left with is this, this root 5. 1 plus root 5 over 2, minus 1 minus root 5 over 2, 2 root 5 divided by 2. So there's a square root of 5 in the denominator. And upstairs, uh, you get something. So maybe it's worth writing out explicitly what it is this time. You get 1 plus root 5. Um, 1 plus root 5 over 2. That was the r plus, n plus, we raise that to the n plus 1 power. And we're subtracting off this other term, which is 1 minus root 5 over 2. And that's the n plus first power. And we have some, some kind of fraction like this. But that just is cn. And by the way, I should go back up to the beginning here and realize this whole thing was actually f of x to begin with. This was our original generating function. So these cn's are actually the an's from all the way back at the beginning, right? Because we said that f of x was the sum of 
a n x to the n, and we found some different power series expansion of it, um, where the coefficients are these c n's, so the c n's have to be equal to the a n's. So this whole thing is a n, which by the way is supposed to be our nth Fibonacci number. And so this is this is a closed formula for it, right? Because if you just give me the n, then I just plug it into this, and then there's no a sub n minus 1 or a sub n minus 2 or anything like that floating around. It's all just a function of, of n, right? So there's an n plus 1, n plus 2, or n plus 1. So this is our closed form. And there's actually something a little bit nicer you can get out of this. So we're, we're essentially done now, right? We found a closed form for it. You can plug this into a calculator. Remarkably, this thing is an integer. It is not at all clear that this, this thing would ever be an integer, right? It's some, uh, something involving like square roots and fractions. Then you're raising it to some crazy power. And you're subtracting off something similar raised to a similarly crazy power. And you're dividing by a square root, right? So like super unclear that this would ever be um, even a rational number, much less an integer, but uh, it must be, right? <laughs> if you, if you, uh, right, so it's just equal to the power series we had above, or we constructed it where the coefficients were just integers. Um, so yeah, some, some uh, kind of miraculous magic going on there. Um, and then there's also something kind of nice here. Um, we have the closed form. I want to talk a little bit about the asymptotics of this form. Um, for large n, if you think about n really, really big, uh, kind of what happens to this term? Uh, in general, we wouldn't be able to say much. It's just some really big term, potentially, minus some other really big term. But there's there's something kind of nice happening here, where this term is strictly bigger than 1. Um, one way you can see that is root 5 is bigger than 1. Right? It's bigger than root 4, which is 2. So this is like bigger than three halves. Uh, but it only matters that it's bigger than one because if I'm raising something bigger than one to a big power, uh, it gets bigger. So this term is going to be getting larger. And it turns out that this whole thing here is actually less than one. It's, uh, I think you even get it, you can get a pretty tight bound on it to be like less than one half, for example. Um, but the, the main point is it's less than one. And if you raise things that are less than one to a big power, they get smaller. So what I'm saying here is that this whole thing has absolute value uh, bigger than one. And this whole thing has absolute value less than one, which means that if you start taking really large powers of n, this thing is gonna get really big, this thing is gonna get really small. And so the dominating term, if you have a large n, it's going to essentially look just like this, with some marginal sort of small error coming from this term. So you can ask yourself, we can try to approximate it, right? So just try the approximation. So for large n, We'll say cn, well, cn, an, we know they're the same now. We just take this entire thing up here and forget about the, the other term. An was exactly equal to cn. Cn could be, well, it's exactly equal to this as I've written it. But if I just take off this entire term, then I get an approximation. And the question is, is just like, is it a good approximation or a bad one? Um, and if you think about the bound for a minute, that this thing was less than one half, I guess I'll have to leave it to you to actually to show that. It's not too bad, I promise. Um, that actually means it's a pretty good approximation because one half, uh, one over two to the n goes to zero pretty quickly. So uh, what happens, um, Right, so yeah, this is the last thing. So since, okay, let me just write this. I, I could also write a n, let me call this thing c tilde n. The c tilde n is just defined to be this ratio. I'll say the a n is approximately equal to that. a n was our, was our number. 
in the sequence. Here I'm just taking some approximation where I left off that one term. Um, so it turns out um, that since, all right, so this whole thing up here was our plus to the n plus one. This whole thing here was our minus to the n plus one. So since absolute value of Rn plus bigger than one, and you can show that the absolute value of Rn minus is less than one half, the difference between um, so like the difference between the actual Fibonacci number and this approximation that we're taking where we've left off a term ends up being no more than one half. Just because we're neglecting a term here whose magnitude is no bigger than one half. But now there's something kind of nice. Uh, An we know is an integer and Cn is not an integer, right? Because we've left off some term, uh, but it's no more than one half away from the correct answer. So if we just round it to the nearest integer, we'll get an exact formula, right? Implies that a n is just equal to, so I guess uh, I know what great notation is for this, like c n tilde, and you might have to take the floor or the ceiling, depending, uh, but this is just the, the nearest integer function. And this formula is exact. This is an exact formula. Uh, maybe since, right? Since the ANs had to be integers to begin with. Well, really, they're natural numbers, but there you have it. Uh, right, so let's just quick re recap of what we did. Go back up to the beginning here. Started with the Fibonacci sequence. Um, we noted that there were like a bunch of different Fibonacci sequences. Um, so I have to sort of specify these first two uh, numbers to give you like the standard usual Fibonacci sequence. With this rule that you add to get the nth term in the sequence, you add the previous two. You turn that into a recurrence relation that's valid for some uh, values of n, where you also maybe need to specify some initial conditions. And then you go into playing these games with generating functions again with the that the problem you're trying to solve is like, can I find um, some formula for a n or a n plus one that only depends on n and doesn't depend on all of the previous terms in the sequence? Right. You can imagine that it would be computationally much more effective to just plug your thing into a formula rather than computing. You know, if you want the one millionth term, you don't have to compute nine hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine previous terms to get it. We use this thing about generating functions which gives you a way to get at this, and being to take your sequence, wrap it up into a generating function, find some closed form for it, this f of x, this rational function of x, and then find maybe some different way to expand that closed form, um, maybe as like a geometric series or something, to get a handle on the actual coefficients um, in some different way. And then maybe with those actual coefficients, you can get some closed form from that. We did that, the method was, Take your recurrence relation, uh, multiply everything by x to the n, and then sum over all of the values for which that recurrence is valid. And then everything from here to here was just playing with indices to get f of x to show up and really just rewrite your sums in terms of f of x. So that way you can solve for f of x, hopefully as some rational function. And that ended up working here. We got a rational function out of it. We simplified things and found that it was was this. So now I've wrapped it all up. The idea was to expand it back out again, maybe using geometric series. So we did partial fractions. There's this kind of cover-up method where it's really like computing a residue um, to get it as some, some function like this. And then we note that you can just kind of pull the A out in front. And then what you're seeing down here looks an awful lot like a geometric series that you can expand. So once you figure out what those coefficients need to be, they're just some numbers. Um, you go back down here, you take these, we had some number out in front, we had these two fractions, which are like 1 over 1 minus x, roughly, 
and then we expanded them out as a geometric series, and then we just collected coefficients, and noted that the coefficients appearing were now just numbers. But they weren't the, the original a sub n's we started with, like we knew that that was abstractly some Fibonacci number, now we're seeing it's some kind of root of that polynomial um, that came out of the denominator and the generating function. Once you have that, you can just read off the coefficients. The cn was this numerical value, whatever it was. And now you can kind of play games with this numerical value. And for example, you know, just plug things into it. You see it only depends on n. So I can just plug an n into it and get my exact value of the nth Fibonacci number back. Um, you can also just try to approximate it because in general, you'll get like a much more complicated kind of function out of this. Um, but maybe you just kind of leave off some terms or something. And then if you can put in like sufficiently nice bounds on your terms, like say you know your sequence is integer valued, if you're um, neglecting a term that's no more than one half away from the correct value and your sequence is an integer, okay, just round your thing to the nearest integer and you'll get an exact formula. Okay, so I think that's, that's pretty much all I wanted to say for this computation. I think it's, it's really fun. A uh, nice thing to work through, um, gives you some handle on like how to work with series um, and their indis indices, some sort of non-trivial steps there, but I think it's, uh, it's a really fun thing to try and work through. Uh, all right, so if anybody has other ideas for computations they'd like to do or like to see, uh, maybe just let me know in the, the comments or drop me a message.